All right, everybody, we've got our final speaker of the day of the event coming up next. So again, we are keeping the introductions pretty brief uh, and everyone's got their full bios in the uh, biography packet, but I, I, I do want to just say a quick word. Um, what Jim is going to talk to you about, you'll, you'll see more, but it just, uh, it's due to people like him who have the courage to, when they see something that they know is, is wrong and in some cases illegal, having the courage to stand up and, and say something about it and that can often come with great personal and professional cost, but at the end of the day, it's still the right thing to do, and I think we all owe Jim Keen a, a great debt of gratitude for, for doing just that. So please help me in welcoming Jim Keen. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. The first thing I wanted to do was um, thank the Harvard Law School Animal Law Policy Program and in particular, Chris, for inviting me. It's been a great, I've learned a lot as a non-attorney. There have been such high concentration of attorneys in my life. <laughs> um, the second thing I wanted to say was um, a couple weeks ago, I was in Manhattan, Midtown Manhattan, at an ASPCA uh, event. And uh, former Senator Bob Dole was there to receive an award. And um, as most of you probably know, he was instrumental in supporting and in sponsoring the original 1966 Animal Welfare Act, um, and maybe the other ones too, I'm not sure, it's kind of a long, he got, he got a lifetime award from ASPCA basically. Anyway, he made a, uh, to give you maybe a smidgen of hope with, with our new president-elect, uh, uh, Bob Dole is uh, uh, a friend or he knows uh, Donald Trump, and he said the next time he sees him, he, and Donald Trump has no pets, he said, so the next time he sees him, he's going to ask request uh, the, Don the Donald, he said, to get uh, at least one dog or one cat, preferably two. So maybe um, it'll help him. OK, this is my first time giving this talk, so I don't know how it's going to go. Um, it's kind of a personal story, a little bit of science in there. Um, there's kind of two themes. One is what happens when research livestock are exempt from the AWA and IACOC protocols. And the second case, or the second, I think, message is what Carney had said today, the title of her talk, I think, was winning the case against cruelty. And um, this was probably a small victory. Um, so I'll give you a little bit about my, my background. i am been 30 years um, livestock veterinarian. Most of the time has been as a researcher. Um, I was clinical large animal veterinarian for a, few, for a short time. Then I went into research in infectious disease. Um, most of my work was studying microbes in a lab, or I'm also trained in epidemiology, so studying the natural disease in the field. So I did very little of my research actually on the Meat Animal Research Center, which is what the mark stands for. But in the name of full disclosure, I also did, Sue Leary mentioned, um, monoclonal antibody production, and I did do, for about five years, I did a lot of monoclonal antibody production, which, involved, which entails basically injecting tumor cells into a mouse's abdomen to make uh, secrete antibodies, and then the mouse turns into a pear, and then you suck the fluid out to concentrate the antibodies. So if um, God is a mouse, I'm in trouble. Um, the second thing, um, I did do some mouse infectious agent challenge work um, I was a strong big egg supporter until about six or seven years ago, kind of, um, I saw no problem with it. I guess I, I would uh, attribute that to mindlessness probably, just wasn't aware. Um, and what Bernie um, Ronald said yesterday, I was, I was taught in veterinary school, went to your of Illinois, and uh, what I was taught was if an animal is producing, if livestock are producing or reproducing, that their welfare is fine. And I was told by a recent graduate of Illinois that they're still te that's still being taught there in the veterinary school there, which actually surprised me. Um, let's see. So I'm going in this talk. I'm going to give um, some exact example of vignettes of livestock abuse, um, where I used to work at a large federal livestock research fa uh, facility, which, as you know, federal livestock specific exemption from the aid. WA. I was thought of that event, Jesse Helms. I'm not sure how that got in there, but for some reason they're made exempt. Um, but um, there are many, 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 many other cases. Some of these are in the New York Times piece. I may refer to some other ones. So this is just some example ones, basically. 
So one thing that is actually, it's depressing, but it's also useful, is that there's a great connection between animal welfare, food safety, environmental pollution, workers' rights, and transparency in the big livestock or the big ag system. And I've seen, I did actually about 15, 16 years of work on food safety, salmonella and E. coli and things like that. And in a big ag environment, you can't, they, they're there because of the, um, the environment that they put in. Um, so those are all links. So you can deal, if you deal with the, say, uh, environmental regulations, you can, you can, you can improve that in welfare. Um, for example, uh, big ag survives, uh, the concentrated or the CAFOs, they survive on use of antibiotics because they're in such a crowded and dirty conditions without the support of antibiotics, you could not have that system. So if you take a system to remove the antibiotics, then the system has, the, the density of the welfare has to improve. So that's why a lot of these um, different elements are linked together, closely intertwined. But that means the remedies are intertwined too. So that's, it's kind of a good news, bad news thing. Oh, by the way, does anybody know what that is a picture of? Chris probably does. Does anybody, want to, anybody know what that is? It's a, it's a feedlot. There's this gentleman, Mishka Henner, he takes satellite images and composites them. So. And this is the waste lagoon there on the right. It looks kind of beautiful from a distance, but up close, not very pleasant. So I had a long association from 1988 to 2014 working at a place called the U.S. Minima Research Center. Um, and it's run cooperatively between the USDA Ag Research Service, which is a research arm of the USDA, and the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And uh, for 17 years, I was with the USDA, and then for about nine years, I was with UNL. So I was, at, had, I was on um, both sides of the fence. But they have about a $22 million budget, uh, appropriated federal budget, and then about they sell excess livestock, so it depends on the price of livestock, but it's about $5 million a year. So uh, over the 50 years they've been, in, been there, it's about $1.3 billion. Um, it's 35,000 acres. Um, Manhattan's 15,000 acres, so it's more than twice two Manhattans. They give you, give you some, it's big. To drive across it's about 10 miles. Um, it's got in the springtime, when all, all the animals, most of them are born, it's got about 30, 36,000 animals. You see the numbers there. And if you add it up over time, um, it's about 1. Million, 1. 1.8 million livestock years over the 50 years. So it's a lot of, um, it's a lot of, cumulatively, it's a lot of livestock years at risk, if you will. And the mission of um, the U.S. Mark is is to generate uh, science and technology to solve priorities for the three prominent meat species, red meat species, which are cattle, sheep, and swine. Um, and their objective is really focused on uh, red meat production efficiency, which is sort of, those are sort of the magic words in industrial um, farm animal. Or, um, to the benefit of consumers, producers, and agribusiness, agribusiness, which actually is a big driver of work they do. Their primary research uh, method and the reason it was founded was for develop new breeds of cattle by combining combining multiple um, other breeds. Basically, if you know British breeds and continental breeds, which they call composite or synthetic breeds. Okay. So this gives the numbers of um, of cows, breeding cows, and the calves that are produced every year. Um, so you can see, even though there's 600 pigs, pigs have large numbers of litters, 13 up to 13 or 14 pigs. They make 14,000. They uh, uh, give birth twice a year. So there's a hierarchy. Uh, it's like a case system, I would say, where cattle are at the highest, and they're treated very well, and then swan and the sheep are treated less well. And there's a nickname that it's almost a version of the old cattle um, sheep wars in the West. Uh, the nickname that the cowboys give the sheep is uh, prairie maggots. So there's this, um, uh, anyway, cattle are king there. And the interesting thing is, it's a USDA facility, but all the livestock are owned by, or, or were until two years ago, they're owned by the University of Nebraska Lincoln. And the reason, um, and so how it works is basically all the time, to, it's basically a small campus surrounded by a big ranch. And um, so the scientists who work on the campus work for USDA, and then all the people who work outside in the field and surrounding it, they're um, uh, University of Nebraska employees. 
And then, so I worked on the USDA side, and there's also a small kind of independent uh, veterinary center, which is called the Great Plains Veterinary Education Center. And I was there uh, for um, six years, six or seven years after I left USDA. And it's just, it's a and it's on the campus. So there's three clinical vets. I had a, just a partial clinical appointment. I did mostly teaching. And, and students come from around the world to get trained there because there's lots of animals. But the strange thing about the MOA, the member of understanding, is that um, the, these, if you're a veterinarian there, you have no permission to touch an animal, to treat an animal, unless you get permission from the USDA first. So you could see something um, horrendous, but you can't do anything about it unless you get permission first. So I'm not from the, usually from the scientist whose animal that animal is a part of. So you'll see that that matters uh, later on. Um, but it is also, it is the world's largest uh, livestock research center. It's, it's a very big place. Now I'd like to, uh, uh, what's, what's, ha what's happened in um, uh, farm animals, I guess, in the past, post-World War II, especially since, say, about 1980, I would call it the doc objective missile hide. It used to be called animal husbandry. Uh, now it's called animal science. It used to have farmers, now they're producers. And in my own profession, it used to be called large animal vet, now they're called food supply vet. So, um, and so uh, the next slide is, so what drives this kind of switch to Mr. Hyde from Dr. Jekyll? And there's basically three, it, it, the uh, U.S. Mineral Research Center is basically, it's, an, it's the Mayo Clinic or the NIH or if you're an animal, uh, industrial animal scientist, that's the place you want to go. Um, Probably that it's got the best reputation in the world, but these are the, basically the three um, underlying principles that they use. The goal at the top of the pyramid is production efficiency, which means generate the product, the most product for the least amount of inputs. Um, and, and basically, it's the KFO or prison model. Um, as I mentioned before, it's very dependent on antibiotics because you cannot raise animals in close confinement without the crutch of antibiotics um, if, uh, or other drugs. Um, feed efficiency is important because about 75% or so of the cost of raising a food animal is the feed. So they're always looking for the cheapest feed you can get. Um, I mean, I've seen pictures of uh, feedlots in Idaho, for example, where they're feeding McDonald's um, hamburger buns that expired. And they'll feed anything they can find. But there is this unfortunate um, tendency, I call it the anti-zombie effect, where they feed the, um, the dead um, or the living eat the dead. An example of that was the mad cow disease from several years ago. They were feeding dead cows to live cows, and that's just generally not, cannibalism is just generally not a good idea. Um, but they, um, but that's been true. Um, that's, they may, and there's consequences when you do that. Um, and the focus of U.S. Mark was genetic selection, and it's sort of the belief. Uh, I, I think it is a, a, I call it the mythical pan solution of a problem. And basically, what the solution is, you exaggerate one body system. So if you look at a modern dairy cow, it's basically a gigantic udder attached to a normal-sized cow. If you look at a Holstein cow, that's basically the model. And you see some examples of this. Um, same thing is true of broilers and poultry. Have you ever seen a broiler? They're just this abnormal blob. Looks nothing like a regular chicken, because it, it exaggerated the muscle in that case. But usually, when you do that, you've got blowback from just a lot of bad things tend to happen when you focus on just one particular genetic trait. And I should say, the veterinary profession, a lot of times, it's, we're a cleanup crew for the bad things that happen, but we're also enablers of the system. Um, um, so there's, um, there's, what do I want to say, there's onus on both the veterinary profession and the animal science profession at Mark and elsewhere. So I'll give some examples now. There was a project that ran for 30 years, I'm guessing, I don't know, probably cost 100 million tax dollars was called the bovine twinning project. And basically, if you look at a cow, it's got four udders. And cows generally give birth to one calf. Typically, you get twins about 1% of the time. So the uh, one, former director of the center said, well, they got four udders. We should be, they should be able to raise four calves, up to four calves. So they basically got uh, um, bought cattle from around the country that had given birth to twins or were a twin. And they selected, and over 30 years, they got the twinning rate up about 50%. So technically, it was a great success. 
The problem was, um, it's, I, I use the term bio-unnatural. There's a reason, evolutionary-wise, why cattle only have one, one offspring. And um, when, you have, when they have multiple offspring, for example, you've got all these body parts together, uh, so they, they have a hard time giving birth. The legs get stuck together. Just the way the cow is designed, they really can't have twins very well. They get, so that's the social means difficult birth. They get a lot of mastitis, inflammation of the udders. A lot of the calves die early because they tend to be smaller. You've got one uterus designed for one, but there's two in there, right? There's only so much nutrition for them. And then maybe the worst thing is when you have a male and a female calf together, the, the, the testosterone from the male calf will um, basically turn the female calf into hermaphrodite, sort of half male, half female. And the most valuable uh, com uh, 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 product of a pregnant cow is a female calf because that's the next, next generation replacement calf. So you're basically not, you're not getting the most valuable product. So um, the outcome of this, there was no market to ban. In fact, most farmers will cull uh, dairy cows or beef cows that have twins. It just doesn't work. But this went on for 30 years until finally um, it ended. Um, I'll talk about this later, but um, U.S. Mark had no IACUC until this year. They're starting to get them. So it went for 52 years without IACUC. Um, there's a reason for IACUC as well. So this proposal, I don't know why it went for 30 years, but it did. Here's another example that uh, Mark worked on. Um, this is called the, um, this is a um, Belgian blue uh, bull in this case. And there's a mutation in a gene called the myostatin gene. The myostatin gene is what turns off muscle growth. So if that gene is defective, muscles keep growing. They never stop growing. This happens in one that has two copies of the gene. Um, so what US Mark did, they, went, they, they mapped the gene, and then other people used that. Um, and, they, and they tried working with this, tried. This doesn't work very well. They get too hot. They have dystocia. If you're a female, you can imagine how to give them birth with that muscle mass. They have low fertility. Uh, low stress tolerance, just lots of bad things, um, and the meat's not very good either. So they tried crossing them half with some other breed. It still didn't work. So again, after I don't know how many years, or this was relatively short, maybe 10 years or so, they abandoned it. I don't know uh, how much money they spent on it. But again, there was no market demand for it. Here's another example. It was done with sheep, um, sort of like the, the cow one. Um, again, the goal is production efficiency. If you're a meat animal, it means more meat. So there's a gene that came out of Australia. It's a mutation that's called the Calipese gene that translates into shapely buttocks, which is kind of a weird name for a gene, but it's a double muscling. There's two copies of muscles. So the one on the far left has the rear end of the animal is much bigger. So um, again, the problem with this was dystocia, difficult birth, poor lamb survival, and the meat was like shoe leather. So, this was also after many years and millions of tax dollars, it was abandoned, again, no market demand. So again, you see the model here is genetic selection, basically, but focusing on a single trait. And, but it's related to uh, production efficiency, in quotation marks. Okay, now, um, this project is actually still ongoing. It's called the Mark Easy Care. I call it the No Care Sheep Project. So what's the driver for it? The problem is the U.S. commodity sheep uh, industry is on a, a death curve or extinction curve. Um, since, uh, after World War II, there are about 56 million sheep, and now um, probably less than 5 million now. So you can, and so this was sort of a, a last gas attempt by a researcher at U.S. Mark, which was supposed to be the crowning um, piece of his career before he retired. But basically the idea was to increase the sheep production efficiency by minimizing the labor, minimizing the feed inputs, minimize human attention, um, make them a hair breed, which is wild sheep are hair, to get rid of the wool, because wool, U.S. wool has very low value. And it costs about $10 a shear to shear the wool off of animal. So it's a negative to have wool nowadays. Um, and also, again, to have twins or triplets. So this ran from, I'll explain a little bit the details of it in a moment, but it ran, well, started in 2002, it's gonna continue, it's gonna end this spring, after lambing season is this spring. And it produces, so they have about 1,500 ewes on the project, which produce three to 4,000 lambs per year. The ewes are kept on these isolated pastures, really in the middle of nowhere. Um, I can't describe it to you, except it's, uh, it's just a gigantic open plain grass. Um, 
There's no shelter, there's no shade, there's no trees. Um, it does flood sometimes, I guess they get water once in a while. And by experimental design, the shepherds cannot intervene if they see anything wrong. It's a hands-off approach. Um, so if you see a sheep in need uh, of whatever difficult birth, you have to just uh, don't do anything. Um, and what's defined as a genetic su success is a ewe that survives and rears lambs without any human um, assistance. So it's sort of like um, maybe the twinning project I mentioned with the cattle. So the goal here was to reconvert a human-reliant domestic sheep back into wild sheep. Sheep were domesticated about 10,000 years ago from the wild mouflon, which is a hair sheep. And then, again, domesticate 10,000 years ago. So for about 10,000 generations, we developed, there's many, many, probably 500 different breeds of sheep. But during that time, they became very dependent on humans, and, they, and we had wool as a byproduct. So the purpose of this project over 15 years, what I call it, they're trying to rewild them. So basically, get rid of the, get rid of the wool, turn it into hair, and manage them as if they're wild, even though they're wired to be a domestic animal. Maybe like letting your dog go in, um, you know, like worse than a feral dog probably, but yeah, it's a domestic animal, depend on humans, and take the human out of the equation. So in the Midwest, typically in the wintertime, you shelter them. Um, of course, they have wool, not hair. Usually they're south-facing buildings. On the East Care Sheep Project, they were out on pasture year-round, the ewes were. So you're in snow, you're in rain, it doesn't matter. You're in heat in the summer. Um, again, in a typical Midwest sheep operation, you're going to lamb indoors, and you, and you can find them in a small area, maybe five feet by five feet, so that right after birth, so the mother bonds with the offspring. If you don't do that, the mother doesn't bond. So if she has a single offspring, it's 24 hours. Two offspring, it's 48 hours. Three offspring, it's whatever that, another, whatever that number is. Uh, three times 24. And you have a heat lamp to keep the lambs born. On the Easy Care Sheep Project, they lamb on pasture, lamb in May, which is relatively, start lambing May 1st, which is relatively uh, late in the year, but there's, we get hail, sometimes snow, um, definitely um, issues. And the other issue is because the lambs are not confined, usually the first lamb that's born will bond with the mother, but, the, but there's twins or triplets, which most they have, the mother ignores that. So they're just basically abandoned because the mother, doesn't, the mother has to bond them quickly um, or sh um, the lamb is on its own. So again, typically in a regular Midwest sheep operation, they're on, pa on pasture in the summer when the grass is good, and then, but in the other ones, um, they're on pasture year round. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wild animal lifestyle, basically. So as you can sort of pr uh, predict what would happen, there's some adult ewe lamb deaths, but primarily it's lambs that die. Anywhere, it varies year to year, but anywhere from probably 25 to 50 percent of, of the lambs would die. Um, and this is sort of a flow chart what can happen. So the, first of all, the ewe and lamb, if the ewe and the lamb don't bond, then the lamb will, be a, um, will get abandoned on the far right. It'll wander from the flock, it'll have no milk, It'll die of exposure, because if, if a lamb can only live about 24 hours without nursing, it runs, it's got some fat, then that runs out, or coyotes will eat it. There's tons of coyotes there, because it's away from the flock. Um, so you can see some of the coyote killed ones there. Or uh, sometimes there was a hailstorm a couple years ago, I guess it's been three years, when I was out there, and it killed 150 lambs from one hailstorm. Um, let's see. Or the lambs don't get enough colostrum, which is productive antibodies. Um, or they starve, uh, they don't get antibodies, they'll get pneumonia or enteritis later on. So um, just a lot of bad things happen, especially to the lambs. So here's an example, I took this picture, um, this was happening one day, about 30 lambs died in this one day. One of the bombs from a coyote, the one with all the meconium stain, and that's a dystocia, the lamb had a difficult birth, um, couldn't get out so it suffocated. Uh, the one above is the hypothermia, it froze to death, I mean it died, not enough energy cold, and the one on the top is starvation. I don't mean to ruin your lunch here, but there's a pile of dead lambs. Um, here's the one that was killed by a coyote. They, they oftentimes grab him in the head, see the brains excluding from the top, or sometimes they'll grab him in the neck. Um, here's one that's starved. It's very easy to diagnose. That's the stomach open up. There's nothing in there, right? So you know it died of starvation. So really, those diagnostic, it's very easy to diagnose the cause of death. 
Um, so what were some of the flaws in this? You could probably predict these yourself. Sheep well-being, sheep well-being and welfare uh, failures from predators. When they have hair, not wool, they don't have the insulation power of wool, right? If you have, if you have a wool coat on, it's much, and especially if it's raining, it's much better. Um, they had twins and triplets, which is okay, but it increases the number of difficult births in dystocia and weaker lambs. So they had, depending on the year, 10 to 50 percent dead lambs. You'd expect uh, one to five percent in well run operation. So over the 15 years of the project, there were 12 to 20,000 dead. I tried to FOIA the data, or the New York Times did, and we couldn't get the exact data. So that's an estimate. So I don't know the exact numbers. Um, so again, you'd expect over 15 years, maybe 1.2 thousand dead, instead there were 12 to 20,000. So that's a lot of lambs. The other problem was, I call it scientific oversight. So over this year, I don't know how much money was spent on this, but, but at least a million dollars a year, they didn't have, after 15 years, they didn't have a single scientific publication off of it. That's pretty expensive uh, research to do. And that's, that's the metric you use in science, is scientific papers. Um, so probably not a very good use of tax dollars. And also, there was no IACUC. Um, no IACUC com committee would ever approve this anyway. I don't think they would. Um, I'd be surprised if they would. Um, OK. Just some other examples. Here's one that here's happened to be. Another thing that happens there is I, I think um, there's kind of a competition. I mean, not a, or a dislike. Maybe that's too severe between animal science and veterinarians. They're competitors. And at US Mark, a lot of animal scientists have no training in surgery. They do lots of surgery. So here's an example of where they did uh, an animal scientist who's not trained. He, did sur he took the ovaries out of a cow, put a clamp on there, but he didn't clamp it right. So there was like a basketball sized blood clot, a cow blood to death. Um, even, um, again, again, there's an eye cut. There's also people doing uh, pig brain surgeries. Another example was, uh, again, maybe four years ago, a technician did surgery on about 60 pigs, uh, about 150 pounds, which is, um, and did, uh, again, they do a lot of reproductive surgery. Took out uh, the ovary on one side. It's a ventral incision. And about two days, she did the wrong suture pad on the wrong suture. And after two or three days, they all started dehissing, which means their guts fall out while they're alive. So um, a lot of, again, I'm those, just a lot. I can keep going on, but um, you got, I think you probably get, get the idea. So, um, so that, that's sort of the scientific side of well-being and welfare. The other side, it's also what I call livestock mismanagement. Um, this is an example of a ewe I saw when I was out teaching with students. Um, I used to teach the small ruminant uh, portion. We were visiting, visiting students. And uh, this was a, a starving ewe and examined it. It had a abscess tooth, so it couldn't eat. And it, obviously, it had been there for months, right very close to where the shepherds were. It just got ignored. It was euthanized the next day. Another problem with uh, probably genetic uh, problem, which they nicknamed sausages, which are uh, rectal prolapses in the ewes. And sometimes they'll hang out that far, and there's, um, they just kind of get ignored. Um, um, they may or may not get dealt with. They had a case of um, about eight bulls. Again, about, well, I haven't been there for a while. This was about four years ago. Um, eight bulls starved to death because they didn't provide any supplementary feed. The, ma the manager refused to provide more feed. I don't understand it. Uh, part of this is the red worst own. Uh, I'm not, I mean, there's a lot of good people, that they, but a lot of times um, the system is against them. Another example of a disease called hardware disease, um, especially in the wintertime when you feed animals, there'll be lots of pieces of metal like in the feed. So what most places do, they run a magnet over the feed to suck the metal out, right? Or you can put a magnet in the cow. What happens is the pieces of metal will get into the stomach of the cow, and then they'll push through the, um, the diaphragm into the heart, and then the heart gets filled with pus. So they call it hardware disease, because it could be a nail or things like that. So it's easily preventable. In the real world, you would, a uh, producer would use, put a magnet in the cow or put a magnet over the feed before you feed it. So they get, every winter, they get epidemics of hardware disease. So that's what I call mismanagement. So there's both scientific malpractice and um, uh, husbandry, mis well, not even hu husbandry mismanagement. OK, so, my, so what after, again, I accepted all this for, uh, for a long time, so nothing wrong. So my own transformation was a slow process from many variables, which I'll get into. But I was sort of, at first, I'd say I was an, an animal welfare atheist, that it's not a real problem. So that came out of ignorance on my part. 
And then I sort of became an agnostic that maybe there could be something to it, but I didn't want to stick my neck out, so I was ambivalent. Um, then at some point, yeah, I guess about a few years, about six years ago, I think I crossed a threshold. Um, and actually, I crossed the threshold about six years ago, but didn't actually become a whistleblower until a couple years ago, so I took my time. Um, yeah, probably out of fear, basically. And the last, yeah, two to three years, I've, I'm an activist, I would say. So I, um, um, it's hard to, when I look back, I don't, I see the world very differently than I did then, and I don't know how I didn't see it before, but I didn't. I think, again, I think it's just mindlessness and the culture I was in, you, you're, I, was, I was around people and accepted it, just never really examined uh, uh, the, that system critically until like, until, like I said, about six years ago, and then I, whoops, I'm sorry, went over this line in the sand. So basically my whistleblowing story is, um, for from 2007 to 2014, which was when I joined the University of Nebraska, left USDA, um, I documented things that I saw or my clinical veterinarian colleagues saw, and I would report those to my immediate supervisor or my director in Lincoln, who head of that school. Did that for six or seven years, and nothing changed. In defense of the great, of, of the great plant veterinary patients that I worked at, they had no real power. That's my chain of command, but they couldn't control the places run by USDA. They could try to influence, but they couldn't actually change it. But um, that's all I could really do. Um, so then eventually, actually I did a Google search for, um, I think I had LA Times, New York Times, Pulitzer Prize, uh, something like that, and Michael Moss is of the New York Times, an investigative reporter, his name popped up at the top of the list, so I sent him a cryptic email. Eventually, that led to us corresponding. We were both uh, cautious. So I didn't know anything about him. It turned out that he, I, I used to work in E. coli 157, which is a bacteria that uh, affects people, hemorrhagic colitis, kills kids and their kidneys. Um, he had won his Pulitzer Prize for doing E. coli uh, outbreak or E. coli linked to uh, a big. Uh, food manufacturer, he actually read some of my papers, which was kind of interesting. So he had a link which I didn't know about. So what I basically did for um, a year or so, I told him where all, I'd been at Mark for a long time, I knew where all the dead bodies were buried, so I told him, FOIA this, FOIA this, FOIA this, FOIA this. So I'm sure USDA knew, they, might, they probably suspected me, but they couldn't prove it, because um, I was already, um, you know, again, I was in that transition phase away from uh, factory farming. And he told me they got about 10,000 pages of documents. And they had somebody full time just going through those documents. So the New York Times spent a false fortune on that story. Um, I did report my concerns to the UNL institutional vet, the person in charge of IACUC. But remember, the animals at US Mark, oh, I didn't say this before, they, the, even though the animals are own, owned by the University of Nebraska, the University of Nebraska exempted them from the UNL IACUC. That's why, no, that's why they had no IACUC. I, I presume it was a political decision. Because actually the University of Nebraska has a good IACUC system, I've been through it. There's about probably at least 15, 16 people on the IACUC board. When you go before them, it's a very rigorous system. So um, if, there, if they would have subjected, those animals should have all gone through IACUC and none of this would have happened, even in the absence of the Animal Welfare Act exemption. Anyway, I was discovered as a leaker in May of 14 because Mr. Moss wanted to come and see for himself the Easy Care Sheep Project. And that's when they were, I was waiting to tell him, that's when they were peak lambing, there were lots of dead, so he wanted to see them. Um, and it turned out somebody, it was on a Sunday, somebody showed up unexpectedly, so I was caught out. And shortly after that, I was banned. Yes, was, that's, what is, what do we know, two and a half years ago, I guess it was. And then, by inaction, I, I, I sought whistleblower protection from the state of Nebraska, but the, uh, he just, the, it's our state ombudsman has the, has the responsibility, but he just wouldn't act on it. He said I qualified, but wouldn't act, so it just an inaction thing. But my attorney at IRE he said he thought it was a political deal, because it would have really made the university mad versus 
one person. So anyway, it made me mad because anyway, um, ended up being on admin and sick leave for seven, eight months. Uh, the university. Oh, here's the um, story, which you can find online. There's, you, you can, if you just search Michael Moss, if you want to read the story, there's other examples which I didn't really include here because you can read the story. Um, so I had to hire a lawyer to keep my job, and he kept my job, which was, um, I'm glad he was expensive. Well, probably cheap. It's, he, uh, it was 250 an hour, which is probably really cheap compared to the East Coast. But for me, for me, that was expensive. <laughs> so, um, for the many hours that I put with him, and, and medical medical expenses too. And then um, I had uh, personal issues. My, my ex-wife thought I took too. It was too risky. Um, at that time, I was supporting. Let's see four kids and a granddaughter and myself, so she thought it was just, I don't blame her actually, because I, I did do, um, yeah, some ri risky things, would probably be the best word. Um, I was forced, anyway, after seven, eight months, I negotiated a return to work, but in the interval, I had a lot of visits from the university, Chief of Police, um, the local police, the state police would follow me, um, and the FBI. And the FBI, um, well, the FBI came because I was a um, suspected eco terrorist. But, um, I, was, I did a radio interview a few months ago. The first time I was asked, would you do it again? And I thought for a few minutes, and I said I would. Um, but I've had a lot of, um, a lot of allies, too. Um, the Times, HSUS, ASPCA, um, Senator, actually Senator Dole, former Senator Bob Carey. Um, I had a lot of um, support, so I'm grateful for that. Um, this is a great quote from uh, Louis Brandeis, who, who basically says, sunlight's the best disinfectant, and I think that is uh, transparency um, and, and the fourth estate, um, I think are both very important. And that's one thing I really, on, as an aside, you know, the demise of the traditional newspaper, one of the first cuts, uh, I, talk, I had been dealing with Michael Moss when I was in New York a couple weeks ago, and the investigative reporters are about the first ones to get cut. The New York Times has gone from 1,500 to about 1,000 now, and they make 500 more cuts. So they're, 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 gut, they're being gutted. So a lot of that power of the fourth estate is going away, which I think is, is not good for our society. Um, so what were the drivers of abuse at Mark um, over 50 years? Um, one was they have non-competitive uh, research funding. Most of their money is directly allocated by Congress at a university, and probably anywhere, at least for, uh, you, have to, you, you fight, you write, you write a grant and you compete against other, everybody else. And there, they just get their 22 million or a year plus $5 million on selling animals. So they can do non-rigorous or non-relevant, or I call it entitled research. There was no oversight um, because they're exempt from the AWA. The University of Nebraska exempted them from IACUC since 1985. And then the ARS actually independently required that all ARS institutes have an IACUC and, uh, beginning in 2002, and that was also ignored. So there were multiple levels of, of oversight and um, I would say unethical animal welfare exemptions. Another issue was they didn't have IACUC, but in a lot of papers, the Mark scientists would fraudulently claim that the research was IACUC approved. Because most reputable journals, if you don't have a statement in there that is IACUC approved, they won't publish it. So they had, they had, they had to put it in there. Um, so that was, um, I ain't gonna call that fraud. In fact, the main journal they publish in is called the Journal of Animal Science, because the Journal of Animal Scientists and the, the, um, the journal considered retracting all their papers going back to 2002. In the end, they didn't do it, but they, were, they almost did. They said, well, it's, it'd be too big of a deal to do it. That would be hundreds of papers. So um, I kind of wish that would have happened as a, as a penalty, in a way, for bad behavior, but it didn't happen. 
Um, another issue, a huge issue, is they have a pro-industrial livestock production bias. You discount welfare or culturally blind to cruelty, and, that, and I was guilty of that. And the false assumption, as I was taught, that Bernie Reynolds taught too, is that high, producti high productivity, growing, reproducing, e equals good welfare, and that's absolutely not true. And a fourth issue is the close political ties to big meat, especially on the beef side. Uh, the U.S. market is hyper-responsive to the political power, uh, big ag, both the uh, cow-calf feedlot and um, the slaughter side. And it was kind of a quid quo pro. One of the um, directors, former directors, told me one time, when Mark wants to get, they used to get earmarks. And if they wanted an ear, they cannot directly lobby Congress because of the Hatch Act. So what they would do is they talk to the National Cattlemen and say, we want to do this research. And the National Cattlemen then talks to the congressman, who then would put an earmark in for the work. So it looks like it's coming in. It's a workaround. And in return, like I call it a quid quo pro quo, if I'm using this right, Mark does, I call Mark, in a lot of ways, is the research arm of the industries. Anything that comes up, emergence that they want to deal with, the industry will give them money, and, and Mark will get it done really fast, because they have the, the director could, has the freedom to have everybody work on one project at a time. So they can, uh, so they, they, help, they help each other out, I guess. And there's a former director named Mohammed Kumari, and he said this quote many times. Um, he said, Mark provides needed results for livestock and meat in industries, not needed research. So I think that's a very informative statement. It's, act, it's absolutely true. You find out what results they want, and that's what your research is going to show, because it's kind of a hand in glove. Um, I think someone mentioned, uh, Michael mentioned this, the AWARE Act, which was introduced uh, after this came out, um, it doesn't have a chance of a snowball in Hades of uh, passing, probably, but I appreciate the attempt that was made by, uh, was sponsored by, actually bipartisan, uh, Cory Booker, uh, I know it was one, I don't remember the other ones exactly, but I know it was, it was uh, uh, whatever, both sides of the aisle supported it. Um, it. It's not dead yet, but it's definitely on life support. Um, the question, uh, so um, what happened at Mark afterwards? The publicity actually, when my, Michael Moss asked me, what do you want to happen? One of the first things he said, I just wanted to have that local effect at Mark. But actually what happened, it was way beyond that. Um, I know there are hundreds of thousands of emails and letters sent to the Secretary of Ag's office. At one time, I don't know told me this, there were, the Secretary of Ag had received 60,000 letters related to this after the Times piece. And of the 60,000, 10 supported Mark, the rest did not. So I think that someone asked the question, does public pressure make a difference? Um, and I think it does make a difference, or it can make a difference. Maybe some of them it doesn't, but in this case, it made, it, it made, a, it made a huge difference because it was in the right uh, venue where people saw it. Um, and now USDA Animal Care, as was mentioned by, uh, was it Bernadette Juarez, if she's here? Anyway, is she here? She mentioned, anyway, because of this, even though the USDA is not, or those animals are not subject to the Animal Welfare Act, which is what the, Air, the AWARE Act would have changed, they have the USDA animal care inspections now at all their facilities. So um, functionally, they're subject to the Animal Welfare Act. So whether they're legally or not, functionally is better. It works. Um, the, and actually, one of, they hired two new veterinarians. Um, one only to Zyacuck. Actually, he was my master's student. Just finished his master's, and he got hired there to do that. The previous veterinarian, has been stuck in an office and does, has no contact with animals. So she's been, you can't, they can't fire her, but she has no animal contact anymore. They hired two new, really competent, I know both of them, veterinarians. There was a USDA OIG inf investigation, the final report's pending, but I heard it's, it's going to be kind of a whitewash. I don't know if that's true or not, that's what I heard. Maybe the biggest thing is Congress is withholding, has withheld for a couple of years now, 57 million from their budget. Um, for failure to improve animal care, and they've almost uh, overtly angered Congress by fighting everything because they still deny they did anything wrong, that it is standard in the practice. Um, so all the above changes are forced on them against their will. So it's kind of interesting, um, I think. So I think I'm about done here. I like this Howard Zinn quote. Um, basically, when we're exposed to different ideas, um, we change. We may change our minds, so we have a responsibility to inform others. 
Um, I don't know if you ever read Howard Zinn. I really, he died a few years ago, but I really, I like some of the work he's done. So conclusions, um, one thing I look at is the industrial ag system, which I really don't like now. It's new and postmodern. It's only been two or three generations. Because I remember when I, on my grandfather's, my grandmother and my uncle's farm in the 70s, they still had um, cattle, swine, uh, chickens. They grow five or six different crops. It was a mixed animal plant, and they grew, uh, you know, which, so it's not that long ago that the system changed. And, it, and it's grown this way because of basically ag subsidies. That's what drives the whole system. And a great example of a recent one is Carl Icahn talked to the head of HSUS, um, and basically he threatened, uh, or talk, and then uh, talked to the president of McDonald's. This is in uh, Wayne Pacelli's Humane Economy, and he basically said that McDonald's shop was going to drop. McDonald's buys 10% of the U.S. eggs. And basically, Carl Icahn said to the president of McDonald's, if you don't change, buy eggs from a more welfare non-battery cage method, your stock is going to drop. So that was what drove them to change to convert to getting cage-free eggs. Um, and then someone else mentioned, I don't know who it was, talked about the desperation of ag, um, I think because of the ag gag and right to farm uh, legislations and amendments that are going on. We have both those in Nebraska. Um, so far, they fail, but they may pass, uh, could happen. Um, again, for myself, I was an industrial ag supporter and an enabler um, for decades. And, um, now I'm doing, um, I've submitted uh, actually with Michael McFadden, we've uh, submitted a USDA grant uh, for poultry uh, welfare proposal. I'm also, in, I also, my research now is sustainable ag as well. And um, my interests are really broilers and feedlots. Um, I'm kind of a neo Luddite, I'm technology skeptic, partly because seeing the this was biotechnology we saw, and it's just um, not happy with it. And I'm also skepticismic of peer-reviewed science, because a lot of the things that, that I've talked about here, there's lots of papers say this is great. So you can't take stuff just because people, I'll let people will invoke peer-reviewed science, but you've got to really take that. First of all, anything can get published. There's a home for everything nowadays. And, um, but anyway, the bottom line is I think the AWA is imperfect, um, but it matters. So there's been a lot of, not dismissing, but the, maybe the expressions of the inadequacy of the AWA, but um, if, it if it would have been in place in this case, it would, it would have prevented a lot of these things from happening. I think that's all I've got, so. I want to say one more thing, which I forgot. So um, there's an organization, if anybody wants to become a whistleblower, come see me before you do it. <laughs> but, because I would have done things differently um, if I would have known, but, there, but there's actually a great um, group in Washington, D.C. called the Government Accountability Project. And um, as of this summer, they're representing me. Uh, is the word pro bono, which is great, versus um, <laughs> 250 an hour, right? <laughs> so, anyway, so I, I, I appreciate the legal profession, that's what I'm trying to say. All right, that's, that's it, okay. Yeah, join me once again in thanking Jim Keane for that, and all the work he's done. So there were some harsh images and stories there uh, to sort of show a bit of ray of hope from some of that. At the very end there, you saw Carl Icahn, who happens to be, who worked so hard at, with the McDonald's uh, announcement, he happens to be one of Donald Trump's best friends, and Donald Trump really admires him. So that is a, a glimmer of hope in what we're facing. The other is uh, Bob Dole, uh, since his regards, he initially was planning to come uh, join us. But at 94 years of age, uh, flying to Boston in December was sort of a permanent thing that uh, doesn't happen with his scheduler. Uh, but he would really have liked to have been here. His wife is an alumnus of Harvard Law School, so he sends his regards as well. Um, 
And then lastly, we have a, a birthday person in the room, uh, someone who has been a voice for animals and research for a very long time and who we all, again, owe a, a good debt of gratitude, uh, Dr. Theodora Capaldo uh, from the New England Anatype Vivisection Society. So join me in wishing her a good happy birthday. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Professor Kristen Stilt, the Faculty Director for the Animal Law and Policy Program, to give some closing remarks and just give a personal thank you to everyone who participated and who helped work on and plan this so much. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. I'm just going to take two minutes, so we'll end uh, only a few minutes behind schedule. And as you can tell, um, keeping on schedule is one of the hallmarks of a Harvard Law School <laughs> event, something we're very proud of. But more substantively, I think something um, Jim left his last screen on, the AWA is imperfect, but matters, is imperfect but matters might be a way to even summarize many of the conversations that we had here. But also emerging from that, what really struck me is the common interests that have emerged today, common interests potential for common ground to do common good. And if we just look at the array of people we have here who've talked, who've presented, who've participated, the scientists, the scientific community, the government agencies, we're so grateful um, that th they were here, the advocacy organizations, uh, the media and consumers, uh, of which all of us are, if we can all pull together on this, there are tremendous things that we can do. And I think in that spirit, we really are considering what's next uh, in, this, in this avenue. This conference was fantastic to generate ideas and to raise questions, but we're not done. We're not walking away and saying we did that, and so let's move on to the next topic. Although there are many more topics you will be hearing from us about, the question is what to do next. How do we galvanize a lot of the energy and enthusiasm here? We have some ideas, but we also want to hear from you. What are follow-up events? Events, what can happen next? What kind of secondary meetings or documentation can come out of this? So please talk to me, talk to Chris, talk to Delcy. Uh, we want to hear your ideas. And so I just finally want to, uh, to end with that, that urging and those, that substantive comment, but also just to run through some thank, thank yous again. First to Dean Minow yesterday, who many of you said, could we have her? As our dean, no, you cannot take her away. Um, we need her very much. Um, she speaks about us not only when she's asked and in rooms like this, but out and about. I always hear people saying, oh, your dean was talking to us. And she actually started talking about your program, even though that was not the topic of conversation. So she's a genuine supporter, and she's, she's out there for us. Um, our co-sponsors, who we've already mentioned, the Petrie Flom Center, which is a health law and policy program, and the Food Law and Policy Clinic, just to, again, show the kind of institutional support that we have. Uh, I should say we have institutional support from other friends within the law school who aren't official co-sponsors, the environmental law program and faculty, um, uh, uh, chief among them. Obviously, the Animal Law and Policy Program team has been incredible. Uh, I want to thank Chris and Delcy and Kelly one more time. Um, our graduate scholar, Jess Eisen, who provides us intellectual support, but also today and yesterday, amazing timekeeping support as well. And we're all very grateful to you for that. Our student volunteers who work behind the scenes, the Student Animal Legal Defense Fund. We have the co-presidents here. I think Melissa and Daniel, are you still here? You want to just raise your hand, wave. Uh, we're grateful to you for all your support here and all year. Um, I saw some of your other members here, Namata and others, but to all of you, Kate, thank you for everything you did. And then just if you didn't notice, we do have the pen used by President Johnson. It's in a display case. And I urge you to look at that. And I want to thank the uh, Humane Society for loaning that to us. Uh, that's a very, very, a very special uh, memento. And then also just to thank you all for coming and for coming to our first big event, for participating, for your conversations. And give us your ideas and come back next time. And there'll be many, many more next times. So thank you.